Hello, and welcome to the Rules of the Game podcast, where it is my job to discuss democratic institutions. Taiwan's democratic development has been truly remarkable. Today, it is one of the most democratic countries in the world. The founder of the Republic of China, Sun Yat-sen, already in 1924 praised direct democratic institutions, saying that referendums and recall are the solutions to transforming China into the world's most advanced country. The road to direct democracy took very different turns, though, than what Sun Yat-sen probably had imagined. In 1949, under the leadership of Chiang Kai-shek, the Kuomintang party had to retreat to the island of Taiwan after the lost civil war with the Chinese Communist Party. After it became clear that a return to mainland China was not an option, a new country was built. After several decades under authoritarian rule, the country finally made a consequential turn towards democracy in the 1990s. The ideas of direct democracy, however, were enshrined into Taiwan's constitution very early on. While the direct democratic institutions were dormant in the constitution for a long time, the people of Taiwan seemed to take the political leadership at their word, having internalized the promised instruments of direct political decision making. With Yen Tu Su, I discuss the astounding development of Taiwan's direct democracy since its early days and its crucial revisions and improvements in its usability since 2003. The now ruling Democratic Progressive Party, DPP, made putting direct democratic institutions into practice one of their main campaign promises. The people did not entrust the political elites with determining Taiwan's future. They wanted to take the fate of their country into their own hands and embraced direct democratic power as an opportunity to safeguard the country's political destiny. After several revisions of the referendum law, most importantly lowering the thresholds for ballot initiatives and referendums, direct democracy is now a pivotal part of Taiwan's democracy. Yen Tu Su is an associate research professor at the Institutum Jurisprudentie at the Academia Sinica. He got his bachelor and master's degrees in law from the National Taiwan University and an LLM and a doctor of juridical science, SJD, from Harvard Law School, which is Harvard's most advanced law degree. Internationally, he is an important voice for Taiwan's democratic development. For instance, contributing an op-ed to the Washington Post titled Taiwan is Revolutionizing Democracy. I am very happy and grateful to have him on the show. I am your host, Stefan Kaibertz, and this is the 15th episode of the Rules of the Game podcast. I am a political economist with a PhD in economics from the University of Bern in Switzerland, and I previously held positions at the London School of Economics and Political Science and the Center for Global Development. You'll find a full transcript of the conversation on my website, rulesofthegame.blog. If you enjoy this episode, please leave a review on your preferred podcast platform and share it with friends and colleagues. Now, please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Yen Tu Su. Yen Tu Su. Welcome to the Rules of the Game podcast. I'm very happy to have you on the show. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, thank you for your invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Cool. So I start with the first question that I ask all my guests on the podcast. Uh, what is your first memory of democracy or maybe of politics in general? That's a hard one. Uh, uh, but I put a few thoughts about it. And I guess I can share with you um, uh, and story, maybe not the first memory, but something that uh, stayed with me for quite a while and still influences me. So it's uh, about the late 1980s and early 1990s. I was a high school student at that time. And you know, that time, it's, it's a very different time from, um, from, here, from now. Uh, the democracy uh, it, it was rising 
um, authoritarianism it was in retreat. And, and Taiwan also lived the martial rule maybe two or three years ago, uh, but Taiwan was still under the authoritarian rule of the KMT, the Kuomintang regime at that time. So uh, you see that at that time there, there were lots of uh, marches, rallies, protests demanding democracy. Uh, there, there are so many um, uh, social movements going on at that time. So I get to attend quite a few rallies and sit-ins uh, as, as a high school student, even before I got, got my right to vote. I still remember one time that maybe in March 1990, uh, at the early days of the Wild Lily student movement, a few uh, st uh, college students just began to sit in and camp in a plaza in Taipei just to demand, to, to, to demand democratic reform. And after school, I, I went to there. I, I just want to join them. Uh, I really want to join them. But I, 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 the only thing I could do is to, to stand uh, beside them for, for quite, a, quite a few hours, e even uh, to, to the night. And, and uh, at that time, we, don't, we, we didn't have cell phones. So I didn't tell my parents where I'm, where I'm going. And, but interestingly, they found me there. My, my parents found me there. They, they took me home. And, and to this day, I'm, it's still amazing. To, it's still a mystery to me why, why, they, know, uh, why they knew I, I was there. <laughs> so they came to pick you up. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's uh, that's quite impressive. Must have been a, a, an amazing experience for you uh, as a young person to see so much force in the society to to bring about change and improvements in the in in democracy in the rules how how the country is governed. Yes, and and you know, um, it's not just that the the, the outside world is changing. Uh, it's that you yourself is changing too, so you can you can feel the the transformation. Uh, so beforehand, uh, I was taught uh, as a Chinese, we were Chinese, and and our, our our great mission is to reunify with mainland China someday uh, in the future. But after I, I've been we, we we've been through this uh, uh, democratization, uh, we realized that okay, we we were actually Taiwanese. And, and, and we should learn more about the history, the ge geography of Taiwan, more than the history and geography of China. So uh, you, you can see that um, even my political identity changed over time, thanks to this uh, transformation. And did that also inspire your career, that you became like a professor doing research on, on democracy and, and law? I think uh, a little bit. Uh, I was interested. I also took in, in my college years. I also took part in student elections, student uh, elections for student governments, and, and have some uh, experiences in managing campaigns, uh, student campaigns. And, and later on, I, I was trained as a constitutional lawyer. Uh, but when I came to, uh, but when I went to United States to uh, to study to, for graduate studies, at that time, uh, you know, the, there was a Bush v. Gore decision, uh, so uh, a fast growing development in the field of law democracy, and and that really just uh, got me. So I, I I I count myself as a student of law democracy ever since. So today we would like to talk about especially direct democracy in Taiwan and how it developed, including there is the referendum, the initiative, but also the recall. And as you mentioned before, they are uh, used and have been implemented over time uh, in, in different versions. And I think we mainly want to talk about uh, the initiative and, uh, and the referendum, uh, but also uh, the recall is kind of part of Taiwan's direct democratic uh, history. So I'd like to start with uh, a quote I read in the Wall Street Journal, and that is that Sun Yat-sen, the, the founder of the Republic of China, he praised referendums and recalls already in 1924. And he said they are the solutions to transforming China into the world's most advanced country. 
So this is very early, and it's I think it's it's fascinating that that he mentioned it already. Can you confirm this? Can you kind of say how direct democratic uh, discussion evolved after after that, and what were the main steps uh, like in the early days? Yes, uh, that's actually the reason why the the, Rep uh, the constitution of the Republic of China, the current written constitution of Taiwan, uh, is actually one of the uh, first uh, constitutions guaranteeing uh, citizens' right to uh, direct democracy uh, decision making. So Sun Yat-sen was, uh, the, as you know, was the founder of the Republic of China. Uh, he was a, a revolutionary rebel back then. So he when he traveled to the United States for the support of the, the Republic Revolution in China, uh, he actually saw the development of, of the progressive movement at that time. And that, that's how he found out that there were actually a system and the institution called initiative and recall and referendum at that time. Uh, and then, so he, he bring back that ideas to, to, to China. And so uh, in, in 1947, after the World War II, uh, when the ROC finally uh, trying to, to make uh, its first uh, constitution, uh, the, right, the right to recall initiative and re a referendum was actually written into the constitution. But as you also know, that it's, it's remained on just the rights on just like a, a window dress on the constitution for about more than 30 or 40 years because after 1950, when, when the KMT, the Kuomintang regime, uh, uh, left China and went to Taiwan well, with, with the constitution, uh, they, they, they began their authoritarian rule. So the, the people in Taiwan actually could not exercise this, this uh, direct democratic rights uh, because there were there were just simply no uh, pursuant uh, regulation legal uh, statutes uh, reg regulating the exercise of these rights. So it was not until I think 1980 that there was a, a election and recall law impl uh, implemented in Taiwan, and the first the recall was, was uh, uh, the first the major recall occurred in 1994, though it failed uh, to to reach the the required quorum. And in 2003, it was not until 2003 that we have our referendums act. So that's basically the, his, the, the historical background of the direct democracy in Taiwan. So in the beginning, it was already included. So the idea was already there, but it was just not used because the thresholds to actually, um, you know, get the citizens to achieve a direct democratic decision was was kind of too high, right? So it was really, as you say, a window dressing. Still, it's still remarkable, I think, that it was actually uh, included, even though during obviously authoritarian times uh, in regimes, um, they they often include something like the people's uh, power in 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 the constitutions, but uh, obviously it's not it's not really applied, right? Right. So uh, when we were young, we were taught that the Republic of China uh, was actually a more democratic uh, country than uh, many other uh, democracies because uh, c uh, our citizens not only have right to election, but also have right to recall, to initiative and referendum, even though uh, we could not exercise this, this right until pretty late. Uh, until 2003, for example, for the right to initiative and recall. So... Taiwan essentially after uh, or starting in the in the 1990s did like a remarkable track of democratization so uh, in in 1992 the authoritarian regime was essentially ended and and a more democratic regime started and the first presidential election was in in 1996 and then you had the first referendum law in 2003 so I, I would like to know from you in, in 2003, who brought about this change? Was it, was it more top down? Was it more um, the regime itself that decided to democratize and give the people more, more uh, decision making power? Or was it rather uh, civil society and the people or, or even uh, or parliament that, that pushed for, for that change? Where did that change come from? 
I think we can think of the development as a result of uh, a series uh, of political struggles for about a decade. So in, in the 1990s, uh, the opposition at that time, they actually advocate for having more direct democratic uh, me mechanisms in Taiwan for, for two reasons. The, the first one is they really want to have a referendum uh, so that we can declare our independence uh, officially to, to the world. Uh, so that's why pro Taiwan independence movement, they actually, they really like a uh, refer, they, they are, they are the one of the major driving forces, uh, behind, uh, uh this movement, uh, behind the, the direct democracy movement. And the other one is, uh, the environmentalist, the environmental movement at that time. They also want to have more democratic, direct democratic institutions, uh, institute, uh, because uh, the, they, they thought that major, uh, some major environmental policy decision making should, should not be made solely by the technocrats uh, or by the government. And, and people should have a say on um, whether we, we should have, we, 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 we need, a, for example, the fourth nuclear power plant uh, being constructed. Uh, and so that's another uh, driving force. And, and uh, initially, the, the, the KMT, uh, the, the, the ruling party at, in the 1990s, uh, they, they have serious reservations about uh, direct democracy. Uh, but as you uh, know, uh, since the, the Constitution already guaranteed that people have these this, this rights, and so they don't, really, they don't have many good reasons uh, to, to oppose the, 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 this, this demand, uh, the, to, to delay this demand. So what happened in 2003 is that at that time, the DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party, already won the presidency. And then the president, Chen Shui-bian, at that time, that he planned to, uh, he planned to hold, uh, some national referendum with or without a referendum law. So the KMT, uh, actually controlled the legislative, uh, the legislative yuan, Taiwan's parliament. And they thought, they thought that, uh, maybe we can do something about, maybe we can diffuse, uh, this, uh, this problem, uh, by enacting a referendum law. So, on the one hand, we will have a referendum law eventually, but on the other hand, it will be very, very difficult uh, to initiate and to pass a referendum. So that's that's their plan, and they succeeded because they have the majority. Uh, they have the legislative majority. So they enact the uh, the referendum act in 2003, and the act was often uh, criticized for being too uh, restrictive, uh, too too difficult for people to effort to exercise. Uh, their 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 right to initiative. That's really fascinating because it's it's it shows like the progress of uh, you know direct democracy pretty clearly that it was as you say it was important that it was in the constitution very early on so it was kind of on paper but not not applied right and then came the opposition came into power at least at in the presidency and wanted to actually execute the constitution or the, the rules that were already there. And then the, the Kuomintang, who was in power in the, in the legislative branch, they um, kind of complied. They implemented a referendum law, but which was then with too high thresholds, right? It was still not uh, able to be used. Is, is that kind of a good summary? Yes, that, that's actually right. And, and, and so... Under the 2003 law, uh, it's very difficult to uh, have a, a citizen-initiated ballot proposition being put on the ballot. It takes uh, actually about uh, close to a million people's signature to, to, to get on the ballot. And the law also requires a, a, a turnout the threshold. So you, you need to have a 50-person um, um, voter turnout for the, the referendum to be considered valid. Uh, so it's it's very diff difficult uh, uh, threshold requirement approval requirement, but somehow I mean in addition to the citizen initiated uh, uh, referendums, uh, the president and the legislative yuan uh, and the executive yuan Taiwan's uh, parliament uh, Taiwan's government under certain circumstances under certain conditions can also uh, initiate referendums. 
So, uh, Chen Sui Bian, President Chen Sui Bian back then actually found a found a way to have a referendum anyway to initiate the, the so he initiated the first two national referendum、uh, in Taiwan in 2004. So the the referendum、um, were were held on the same date of presidential elections,、uh, but since there there was a high、uh, voter turnout threshold requirement and the Guomindang、uh, actually managed to boycott the referendum by asking people to abstain from the the referendum vote. So the the first two and the next four、uh, national referendum all failed. But wasn't it the Guomindang who initiated the first two referendums, or was it the, the, the DPP? The the first two、uh, referendums were initiated by the DPP president Chen Sui Bian,、mm. and the、okay. next four national referendums were、uh, initiated two、uh, two by、uh, KMT and two by DPP in in two thousand and eight around two thousand and eight, but they all failed. They all for, failed for, because the thresholds were were too high. Exactly, and 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 since that under that kind of threshold requirement, it's. It's easy to、uh, for the opponents of the referendum to boycott the vote. You can simply uh, uh, boycott the vote by just abstaining from、uh, the, the the voting procedure. Yes, and then、um, the next kind of revision of the referendum law was in two thousand eighteen, or was there still a, a revision before? Because now the thresholds are much lower, right? So maybe can you elaborate what were kind of the next step in in、uh, revising the referendum law and and how it impacted the further development of of direct democracy in Taiwan? Right, so you you are right. The the next major revision actually occurred in two thousand and eighteen, at at January two thousand and eighteen, and that's because、uh, in two thousand and sixteen, the DPP not they, they they won not just the presidency, but they've also won for the first time the legis the, the legislative majority, and since the the reform of the referendum process to make it easier for people to use. It's on their campaign platform,、uh, so they 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 thought they have a political、uh, duty or obligation to fulfill their campaign promise. So in two thousand, at the end of the two thousand and seventeen, the legislative yuan actually passed the major revisions of the referendum act. They not only、uh, lowered the, the the signature requirements for、um, ballot propositions. But they also lowered the the approval threshold for the referendum vote. So now、uh, a referendum would would be considered passed if、uh, it, the the yes vote exceed the no vote, and the yes vote、uh, has the support of the twenty five percent of the electorate. So it would it, it was a much lower、uh, threshold. So following the two thousand and eighteen reform. Uh, there was a, a, a boom, a, an explosion of referendums、uh, in the same years. So,、uh, in, in the, the local elections uh, uh, of 2018, people actually, people voter in Taiwan actually、uh, got to vote in ten referendums, and seven of them actually passed. Wow, that's that's quite high. So people were essentially waiting for for the first few、um, direct democratic decisions, really, right? So campaigns, both probably among among citizens, but also among the parties, were were launched to to use that that tool right away. Yes, yes. So、uh, one thing, one interesting thing about the direct democracy in Taiwan is that the major parties, major political parties, are actually active players using referendum,、uh, using the mechanism of、uh, the direct initiatives. So, for example,、uh, in the the ten referendums uh, uh, held in two thousand and eighteen, three of them were actually proposed by the then、uh, opposition party Guomindang. So, they, so they, they they know how to use because、uh, now they they realize that the re- referendum is actually a, a very useful tool to to set the national agenda. So、uh, and and since that, that since back then、uh, the referendum、uh, under certain circumstances can be held、uh, in、uh, together with the the election. 
Uh, so it, it's also a, a good way to mobilize their, their voters by putting uh, some policy issues on the ballots for people to vote. And, and, and that's why uh, after 2018, in 2019, we have another round of uh, uh, revision of the Referendum Act. And this time the DPP government decided to uh, decouple the, the referendum and the election. So uh, we, uh, from 2019, we are going to have a, a specific special uh, referendum day that is separate from uh, the national election day. Yeah, which is probably a good thing, right? Because you don't want the tool to be used as a marketing tool or, I mean, you know, parties will always use it if they can. I mean, I think that's that's pretty uh, legitimate um, and there is no way around it. And it's also probably a good thing that parties can use the tool as well uh, because they're also part of, of society, right? Um, but de decoupling the dates, having not, you know, the election and the referendum decisions on the same day is, is, is probably a, a, a good thing because it it kind of prevents of trying to influence people uh, to to vote uh, on 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 the party and the referendum issues uh, in the same in the same way. Well, uh, the, the the move was uh, uh, to say the least a little bit controversial in Taiwan. So you 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 were you were think it's not a good idea to separate the election and the referendum if you were interested in proposing a referendum. Uh, of course, pro propose, uh, and 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 the people worry that uh, uh, in the se separate election uh, day, uh, the the turnout would be low and. Uh, uh, they, they worry that the turnout would be an issue. Uh, and, and so interestingly, uh, last year, uh, we actually vote on another referendum uh, proposed by the KMT uh, lawmakers. They want to uh, re return to the old days to have a concurrent referendum election vote. And, and but the, the the referendum actually uh, failed uh, because the, 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 they could not uh, reach the, the, the required threshold. That's interesting. So actually, the, the referendum law is also used to kind of try to amend the referendum law itself in, in that right, way, right? Right. Uh, there's, there's one ballot proposition trying to reconnect uh, referendum and the election. And interestingly, uh, the, last, the last referendum, uh, the na last four referendums we have in Taiwan is last year, last December. And, and they, they were held in, uh, in a on a separate uh, uh, election day. Uh, a special election day, and the turnout is about uh, 40 or 41 percent um, or so. And it, it, it's lower than the, uh, the usual turnout of national election day, but uh, it's, uh, it, I, I, I guess people might think it's still a healthy, healthy turnout. And even under that kind of circumstances, you can see that uh, uh, there's actually a very robust uh, party competition uh, before the, 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 ref, the refer, referendum vote. So this time, uh, the KMT and the DPP, they all uh, uh, participate in the referendum campaign. The DPP, the, the, the current ruling government, actually uh, uh, asked the voters to vote all for, uh, all for no four no's uh in the, in this in this uh, uh referendum and the, the KMT uh in would would suggest that voter vote four yeses and so you can see the even with with uh, a decoupled uh, referendum vote uh, there is still a, a very a robust a very competitive uh, partisan uh, uh competition going on yeah i think uh looking at it from a swiss perspective i don't think a low turnout or lower, like 40% turnout is, is not necessarily a, a bad signal. It's just that sometimes people think an issue is important, right? And they will go to vote. And sometimes they think an issue is maybe not so important and they don't vote. And I think um, that's, that's pretty natural. And as long as people have the option to vote on it, if they really think um, it is crucial, then they can go to the to the ballot box and i think that's that's the important part i quickly want to go back to 
you know, the, the political economy of introducing and uh, re revising the, the law. So you say in 2016, the DPP uh, made it kind of a campaign promise to uh, revise the referendum law. And then once they were in power, you said they came to power in 2016 for the presidency and, and the majority in parliament. Did they themselves think that uh, revising the referendum law uh, was, was a priority among the population? Or why did they make this a main campaign, a main electoral um, campaign promise? Where did that pressure come from? There was actually some some pressures from from the young generations, you know. Uh, after uh, I, I, you know, in in 2014, there was a a, a, a sunflower movement. Stu uh, some student and the civic groups they actually occupied the the legislative chamber for 24 days, demanding for uh, further political reform and uh, uh, not so close relations with China. Uh, back that time, so uh, you you can see the the there were some uh, new political parties entering uh, Taiwan politics uh, after the 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 Sunflower movement. So new parties they actually uh, they also are they are also behind a, a push for a more liberalized uh, referendum law, and so under this kind of pressure and since the the reform of the referendum law uh, was long in the party platform of the DPP uh, so they think it's good for them to just keep the, their promises so they not only uh, revised the referendum act they also lowered the uh, difficulties for recall they also revised the recall law uh, to make it easier to to use but they probably know what will happen uh, later on and so they they anticipate uh, that there, there might be some uh, maybe we can call the age of populism coming to Taiwan uh, they, they, they they have a little bit worry about that uh, and, and so especially after 2018 some people have maybe have some second thought about the referendum because uh, uh, the uh, they they saw the 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 passage of certain uh, social conservative issues and, and some progressive issues actually failed the vote. So some people now begin to worry that if it's a, a, a really a good idea to to let people uh, decide. And what do you think uh, from from the populations from the citizens' perspective? There is sometimes among among the population the feeling that direct democracy is a good thing, and in other countries you feel like uh, people are maybe not as much in in favor of of direct democracy. So in Taiwan, what made people believe uh, in direct democracy, or was that something that developed just over over the decades because it was always written in the constitution, or what was kind of the driver of wanting direct democracy, more direct democracy in Taiwan from, from the citizens' perspective? I guess uh, having constitutional provisions specifically guaranteeing the right to recall referendum and in initiative does uh, make some impact on how people think about uh, direct democracy because maybe it's a really a good thing. That's why we, uh, we put it on the constitution, right? Some people also really like uh, uh, to have direct democracy. Uh, it's just that the, the, the political situation cannot uh, allow Taiwan to hold a, 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 an official uh, referendum declaring independence. So they, they really want to have a major, they, they really want to have a say on the future or the, the most important thing uh, about the future of Taiwan. So that, I, I think that, that one is, for, uh, is, is, is you, can, you can even count that one as a political consensus in Taiwan, that the, the future of Taiwan should be decided by the people uh, themselves, not just the political elites. Uh, and so that part is, is pretty, pretty strong. But in terms of other uh, public policies, I, I think people are still, um, I think they are, they are still willing to uh, have the experimentation of direct democracy going on. And they know that, okay, uh, maybe it's a way to, to solve uh, or, or to decide uh, uh, some uh, div divisive policy issues, uh, or th there's a, a way to have some problems uh, uh, solved, but they are still thinking about how to do it better, how to make a, a sound uh 
decisions. Some people would, would, would think that maybe we should reform the referendum act again uh, to make uh, to to ensure that the uh, we will have more time to deliberate on the referendum issues uh, for people to have uh, more information about what the the vote means. Yeah, I think it it takes time definitely to balance out you know the the referendum law to find the right thresholds. You know what is what is good threshold for people to initiate. Uh, new propositions. Obviously, also, I think the people shouldn't be overloaded with decisions um, because if there are too many, they can't really deliberate and they can't make themselves, you know, know much about each issue. So I think this is this is really important, but it takes time. And for a while, there may be a bit too many referendums, and then the thresholds are maybe adjusted, and 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 over time, it will be uh, optimized. I think also that's how it worked. Uh, in Switzerland, more or less, even though the threshold has been kept quite at the same at the same level, while the the population grew a lot, so um, there have been uh, yes somewhat more um, initiatives and referendums. Uh, but overall, people are still happy to make you know their minds up about all the issues and and decide. And maybe at some point we we will uh, adjust the thresholds. Um, but also, what I I thought was really interesting is that that will that that really um, the drive of the people to take that power to make their own decision about Taiwan's future I think is really important and also probably that was the main driver of the sunflower movement because the people especially the young people that really um, live the democracy they thought that. You know the elites, the political elites. They can't really trust them, right? They can't trust them to make the right decisions for the future of Taiwan. So the people, you know, really pushed for having that power to make their own decisions. I think that's that's really really uh, fascinating. Yes. So so in fact, uh, now we have a law requiring mandatory referendum for any political negotiations and political agreements between Taiwan and China. And since now that the people think that Taiwan is already, at least de facto speaking, uh, already an independent country, so you don't need a, a referendum vote to declare independence, but you do need to have a referendum if you want to change the status quo. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah, and and also crucial for for Taiwan's um, development, future development. Yeah, I guess. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and, and now you also take a, 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 a referendum to amend, to revise the constitution. It's also a, a mandatory one, a, a, the, ratif uh, the, the, the ratification through uh, referendums. That's also uh, current uh, uh, in the current uh, law. So one more question I have is the initiative, the ballot initiative, that's kind of a, a, a bottom-up um, process. Is there still a, a possibility for 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 the government or the parliament to initiate a referendum? I mean, in the sense that it's still possible to use a top-down process to initiate a referendum. Yes, we have, uh, we, we have both the bottom-up and top-down referendums in Taiwan. So mm -hmm. in addition to uh, bottom-up citizen initiate uh, ballot propositions, the, the, the legislature the legislative yuan, the Taiwan's parliament and Taiwan's government and the president, they all under certain conditions can also uh, initiate referendum votes. But their, their referendum would be what we may, what may be called policy vote. It's about uh, some issues of major po policies, whereas uh, bottom up citizen initiate referendums, uh, people can initiate uh, a, a vote on legislative principles or mm -hmm. a referendum of the existing of an existing law or a, a policy vote to wrap up the discussion uh, do you have any books or articles that you can recommend on on the topic i i i've been in, interested in figuring out direct democracy and uh, the the problem of populism lately, mm -hmm. um, and, and I found that the uh, Jam Winner Mueller's book "Democracy Rules" a very uh, informative one. It, mm -hmm. it really helped me think through uh, all th these issues. 
uh, back to the basics of what democracy means. And 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 I also uh, so I, I, I would certainly recommend that one. Democracy rules. I will put that in the show notes for sure. Um, thanks a lot for this uh, recommendation. And uh, yeah, the, I think there's it's fascinating. Uh, thanks a lot for that conversation. Uh, I think we could, you know, discuss so so much more in in different directions. There's so much uh, to talk about. Uh, but I think for the moment we 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 leave it at that. And Yentu, uh, I really thank you for taking your time to join this conversation. And um, yeah, have. I, I really appreciate to having the Taiwan's direct democracy as a as a topic on on my podcast. So thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you for having me, Stephen. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you liked it. Please share it with friends or on social media, or leave a review on your preferred podcast platform. It really helps my podcast and my message to be heard. On my website, rulesofthegame.blog, you find a form to give feedback directly back to me, or just send me an email to stefan.kyberts at gmail.com. I would love to hear your comments or suggestions for upcoming episodes. Take care.